continuing special presentation of the Black Economic Alliance Presidential Forum. I'm Soledad O'Brien. And we are here inside the Charleston Music Hall in South Carolina. Before we get underway, I want to acknowledge that this weekend marks the fourth anniversary of a terrible tragedy. The Emanuel Church shootings took place just blocks from here, and like many people around the country, we want to note that we are keeping all those affected in our thoughts and our prayers today. Our focus today is on black economic progress, the present and also the future. And while the current president likes to tout his booming economy, the truth is that in the last few decades, the median wealth of black families has declined. If current trends continue, economists predict that by 2082, the median black family will have zero dollars of accumulated wealth, zero. Four of the top 2020 Democratic presidential candidates are with me today, and I'll be sitting down with them one-on-one -on -one to press them on their plans to improve the economic plight of black Americans. So let's get right to it. From Charleston, South Carolina, BET News presents the Black Economic Alliance Presidential Forum. Once again, your host, Soledad O'Brien. Thank you everyone again for being here. Our big thanks to the Black Economic Alliance for organizing this forum. Our first candidate joining us today was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. He started a tech company before venturing into politics. He served six years in the U.S. House of Representatives before losing his Senate bid last year to unseat Republican Ted Cruz. With me now, Robert Francis Beto O'Rourke. It's nice to have you. Thank you for having me It's on. my pleasure. Very grateful. Thank you. So let's start with a gap in perception. Based on a recent survey of black adults nationwide, 72% of black Americans say that they are dissatisfied with the economic uh, situation for black Americans. And then at the same time, you hear all these positive economic indicators, the stock market's up, uh, economic growth, we know there's record low unemployment, but data would show that black people are not actually reaping some of those benefits. What changes would you make to make sure that black Americans can benefit from some of these positive changes? On my way over here today, we stopped at a convenience store. And the gentleman who was going in before us and held the door for us, a uh, man named Thomas, um, introduced himself. He, he, he uh, recognized me, knew who I was, and we struck up a conversation. And I asked him what he did. He's a small business owner, uh, African-American man, who was going to his next job site on his bicycle. He's a painter with his paint bucket uh, hanging from his handlebars. And I said, what could we as a country do to ensure that you are more successful. And the first thing that he said was access to capital. If, if I had the ability to get a loan, uh, to invest in this small business, instead of a bicycle, maybe a truck, instead of a one-man operation, maybe an entire team, expanding the services and the number of customers that he serves. And he talked about building wealth for himself, and he talked about building wealth within the black community. So, so bringing more people into this economy, as um, House of Representatives Majority Whip Jim Clyburn just said, making sure that more Americans can participate in this country's greatness by getting capital out in a capitalist economy. How do we do that? Our proposal calls for doubling the size of money that's deployed from community development finance institutions. It calls for shifting $100 billion in federal procurement from big corporations to small businesses and targeting half of that to women-owned and minority businesses. We also call for ending discrimination in the workplace so that more people can get ahead. For example, African-American women in this country today are paid 61 cents on the dollar that a white man makes in this country today. So ending discrimination in the workplace affords greater opportunity for economic advancement for everyone. And, and then lastly, beyond greater participation and inclusion and access to capital, let's make sure that everyone is safe and secure in, in their communities. We were just at a round table in North Charleston and a young woman talked about organizing safe spaces for black men to congregate, to have conversations, and then to make sure that they're safe on their way home. 
safe from police violence, safe from a criminal justice system that has incarcerated more people here than in any country on the face of the planet, safe when it comes to environmental justice. Race is perhaps the best predictor for your proximity towards a polluter and unsafe drinking water in the United States, safe in a kindergarten classroom where a child of color is five times as likely to be disciplined or expelled or suspended. So including everybody, but protecting everybody is essential if this country is gonna reach its full potential. You call for an end to discrimination, and that seems like a very tall order, since obviously that is something that has obviously been a challenge in this country for hundreds of years, mm. and is highly correlated to economic outcomes as well. How do you specifically see that for black yeah. Americans? I'd sign into law as president the Paycheck Fairness Act. What that would do is it would stop discrimination in the workplace by allowing employees to be able to share salary and income and wage information without being punished for doing it. It would free them from um, mandatory arbitration clauses that preclude them from being able to use the courts to hold employers and corporations accountable. And it would do this. It, it would stop using past salary history as a basis for future salary going forward, um, ending that vicious cycle. Only then do, do you get um, African American women from 61 cents to 100 cents on the dollar, Latinas who are at 53 cents to 100 cents on the dollar, and it's got to begin with the executive leadership of the next president. That's why it's a priority for me. Talk to me a little bit about your strategy around affordable housing, which is so critical to economic security. Back in El Paso in 2006, as you well know, there was a plan to take boarded up buildings and turn them into spaces for restaurants and for art and shops. It didn't end up happening, but critics said that that strategy actually really left out people who needed to hear about affordable housing and not fancy restaurants and, and places where they could go and enjoy art. Was your support of that a mistake? No, it wasn't. Um, what we were doing was making an investment in the heart, the city center of El Paso, Texas. And importantly, we made incentives for developers conditional on affordability of housing, affordability as a function of income. So paying no more than 30% of your income to be able to, to live right in the heart of the city or stay in the heart of the city to protect against gentrification and pushing people out. And I'll tell you, right here in South Carolina, I see some extraordinary examples of that kind of leadership. In Columbia, Mayor Benjamin, focusing on his city center, has used community development block grants to leverage 10 to one investment from the private sector and importantly made that investment conditional on affordability. So students at USC, uh, folks who just want to be at the heart of the action can afford to live in downtown Columbia, South Carolina, expanding the number of housing units available. I was listening to folks in Hilton Head recently who talk about employees who drive two hours to be able to provide services to tourists who come to this beautiful state and then two hours back home what if we increase the amount of federal funding, for example, through the CDBG program, but we conditioned it on inclusionary zoning so that the folks who work there can live there as well, uh, making sure that, again, in, in Whip Clyburn's words, everyone is included in the greatness of Hilton Head or any part of this country. So Those are good local examples, but as you well know, this is a challenge across the entire country. So then as president, what would be your number one step in strategy in this? We're going to complement extraordinary local leadership with federal resources and funding. So I mentioned expanding the CDBG program to make those investments, following the lead of another great South Carolinian, uh, Representative Marvin Pendarvis, who's talked about tax credit housing and making sure that states and the federal government are coordinating to double the impact to ensure that we have millions nationally, millions more uh, units uh, of housing so that it is affordable, uh, so that folks can live closer towards where they work, and so that they can afford to put food on the table, uh, medication, invest in higher education, to, to make sure that they're living to their full potential. So I, I see the federal government's role as a partner towards local and state leadership um, in making sure that we're maximizing the, the taxpayer's investment. Have you thought about strategies around 
people who are formerly incarcerated. If you look at women specifically, um, and formerly incarcerated black women face even higher barriers to all of these things that we've already even covered. How would you specifically address their needs? They've paid their debt to society and they come out and then have additional challenges. That's right. First, let's stop digging the hole. Um, we have more people behind bars in this country than any other country on the face of the planet. That population is disproportionately comprised of people of color. So many there for nonviolent drug crimes, including possession of marijuana, something that is legal in more than half the states in the country today. So let's end the war on drugs, which has been a war on people, end the prohibition on marijuana, expunge the arrest records for those caught in possession of something that's legal in so many parts of the country. And then, as, as you said, as, as someone has paid their price, uh, their debt to society, Let's make sure that they don't have to continue to bear the consequences. So banning the box so that you don't have to check something on an employment application form, um, which makes it less likely that, you, that you're going to get the job. Allowing those who've been incarcerated to qualify for student loans because that's correlated to your earning potential over the course of, of your life. And then having um, state-supported services to get you back on your feet, one, because it's good for you, and your family, and two, because it's great for this country. How do you talk the states, I mean, as you well know, people are actually incarcerated in the state level, not the federal system. So those are all wonderful ideas, but as president, how do you actually influence what's happening at a state level? I think you need leadership at, at the federal level. Um, you need incentives that are tied to behavior that you want to encourage from those states. Um, so for example, by ending the federal prohibition on, on marijuana. I think you set the lead for the rest of the states that have not yet caught up to, to do the right thing. Um, when you make sure that you follow the lead of Florida and other states to ensure that those who were formerly incarcerated are fully participating in our democracy because we restore the right to vote, um, you can take the, the, the lead at the, at the federal level. And then, and then tying additional investments to states making the right decisions, or local governments, to, to use Columbia as, as an example again, making the, the, the right decisions. I think that's the best way to, to make sure that, that we're leading, uh, not imposing, encouraging, and providing the incentives for the, the outcomes that we want to see. Just yesterday, you said that white Americans don't really understand the full story of slavery in America. How does that play a role in what people understand about economic disparity between black people and white people in America today. We were in Beaufort yesterday at the Tabernacle Baptist Church meeting with Queen Quet of the Gullah Geechee Nation. And there I learned um, that Harriet Tubman had spent three years of her life. Um, I knew some of her story, but I did not know about her contribution militarily to the Union's victory. I also learned about Robert Smalls right at his gravesite, somebody who came and commandeered a, uh, a, a Confederate ship and, and led many of his fellow Americans to freedom, and then importantly served in public service in the State House and in the United States Congress well after the end of Reconstruction. I wasn't taught those stories in, in grade school or in high school in, in El Paso, Texas. Until we tell the full American story, we will not get to the full American potential. And that story, in, in addition to the successes represented by Harriet Tubman and Robert Smalls, we also have to talk about the, the foundational sin of this country, that those kidnapped from West Africa, brought here to South Carolina, literally built the wealth of this country, and their descendants were locked out of the ability to enjoy the fruits of their ancestors through segregation and Jim Crow and redlining and voter suppression that is alive and well today in 2019. And it is not just expressed in the criminal justice system, it is in education, it is in healthcare where African American women are three times as likely to die from the consequences of maternal mortality as white women. It is in our environment where communities of color are on the front lines of pollution and climate change. In other words, it is systematic and foundational. And, and to some who say that we only need to reform, um, you cannot reform a system that was fundamentally designed for the outcomes that we're seeing today. So, then, um, then how do you, because all of those come back 
to an economic gap, right? Every single thing you've listed is what defines the economic gap between black Americans and white Americans today. How would you, as president, tackle that massive laundry list? Well, we talked about some of the, the specific policies that I will lead on as, as president, but you know, more, more foundational is, is the story that, that we tell one another. Um, there's gonna be a, a tribute to Harriet Tubman in, in, um, in just outside of, of the Tabernacle Baptist Church. And in the rendering, it, it was really striking to me that the children who are looking up at Harriet Tubman are, are all white. Um, I, I think when we know the full American story, everyone's going to be able to fully participate in, in this country's success. And, and importantly, you're gonna have the, the consciousness of white Americans um, that will be awakened to both the injustice and to the opportunity. If, if you look at the challenges that we face, climate change, which perhaps in South Carolina we understand better than any other part of, of the country, we're not gonna be able to meet that by half measures or half steps or only half the country. You're gonna need the full genius and potential, the ingenuity, the creativity, the, the service and the sacrifice of, of everyone. And if folks are locked out, economically, educationally, from justice right now, you will not be able to meet that challenge. So this is in the interest not just of black America, but of all America to make sure that we get this right. And it begins by telling this story. Yeah. Pedro O'Rourke, thank you so much. Thank you very much. We yeah. it. Thank you all for having us out. Bless us. Really appreciate it. The BET Black Economic Alliance Presidential Forum will continue in a moment. Up next, Senator Elizabeth Warren. special needs teacher and a Harvard Law professor. Last year, she was re-elected to her second term in the U.S. Senate. From Massachusetts, please welcome Senator Elizabeth Warren. It's so Hi. nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. We'll dive right in. Hey, can we start there? <laughs> I'm sorry. Just this is always going to be a challenging interview, right. and I don't even get a question out. But I, but I do want to say, I want to pay my respects, because this is the weekend of the anniversary of the shooting at Emmanuel AME Church. Yes. And I just want to say a word about not only that tragic shooting, but about how this community has come together and made themselves stronger in standing for racial justice, social justice, and economic justice. And I admire it when people take something terrible that happens and make something good out of it. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Audience, thank you. Thank you. And it relates to my first question. 81% of black Americans say it is hard to achieve the American dream today. And I look at that statistic and I think that is a terrible statistic. Do you think the American dream is out of reach for black Americans? Yes, I think it's really, really tough. And I think that if we don't acknowledge that straight on, then we can't diagnose what's wrong and make the changes we need to make. So what it just is. What's wrong? Walk so, me through well, a change. let's start. We're here to talk partly about entrepreneurship. Let's just pick that particular piece. We have an entrepreneurship gap in America. African Americans are about half as likely to own their own businesses, to start their own successful businesses. What's the reason for that? It's capital. It's not about not having good ideas. It's not about not being willing to work your rear end off. It's about whether or not you get access to capital. Now, why do African Americans have so much trouble getting access to capital? And the answer is because of the black-white wealth gap. Capital comes from people's pockets, from their friends and family and neighbors. That's how you get a business started. 
But if you don't have that capital, it's hard to get it started. And why do we have that kind of black-white wealth gap? A big part of it is because of discrimination that was actively fostered by the United States government that kept black families from being able to buy homes and to build the wealth they would have built generation after generation. There's a second problem woven into this as well, and that is the people who have capital and who make the decisions about your business is going to get a little startup money and your business is not, tend to pick people who look like themselves. And that's a problem when most of these investors, about 85%, are white, and nearly all of them are men. So we got two big problems on the entrepreneurship front, and I got a plan for how to fix it. The economic patriotism plan is one that you have suggested. Talk it, to me about your plan. It is. So let me talk about the plan for this part in particular. You need access to capital. This is something the United States government should be able to provide. I have a plan to set aside $7 billion to be there for equity investments for black and other minority-owned businesses. Now, equity. And I really want to underscore this is different from the other plans that are out there. Most of the others are about lending. And I'm all for getting access to loan money. You bet. That's great. But small businesses, when they're getting started, they need that equity capital, the kind that lets you ride out the tough times. They don't need something that's creating a big debt burden. So part of this is a $7 billion fund. It would support about 100,000 black and other minority-owned businesses to get them up and started and create about a million jobs across this country. That's a win-win for everyone. Good investment. One more part. And it has one more part to it. That $7 billion fund, my proposal is that it be administered by black and other minority entrepreneurs and by women entrepreneurs. We want to have people in there making the decisions who look like all of America. When you propose similar big dollar funding for apprenticeships for people, a uh, tenfold increase mm -hmm. from $200 million to $2 billion under the economic patriotism plan, many people say that sounds amazing because it is how do you how do you pay for it oh this is the best part <laughs> because i started every one of these proposals with how to pay for it and it starts with a wealth tax on the top one tenth of one percent so here's how it works for anyone who's built a great fortune that is above $50 million, that puts you in the top one-tenth of 1%, 1 we say, good for you. That's great. That's fabulous that you built this fortune. But do keep in mind, you built that fortune here in America. You built it using workers, at least in part, that were educated that the rest of us paid for those schools, right? You built it at least at part, getting your goods to market on roads and bridges the rest of us help pay to build. You built that fortune at least in part protected by police and firefighters that the rest of us help pay their salaries. We're Americans. We think that's great. We're glad to make those investments. We're glad to plow the fields so that the seeds can grow. But here's the deal. When you make it really big, I mean really big, the fortune's above $50 million. That 50 millionth and first dollar, we want to tax it at two cents, that's all. And two cents for every dollar after that, you make it really big, pitch in two cents so everybody else gets a chance to make it in this country. That's the idea. How do you get that proposal through a Senate, well, that's Republican-led. I, I count on democracy working. Because here's the deal. That isn't just a Democratic proposal. That's not something that just Democrats like. Republicans also support a wealth tax. Think about that. They understand that this economy is badly broken. Understand this about that wealth tax. Two cents 
on the greatest fortunes in this country. That's the top one-tenth of one percent. It's about 75,000 fortunes. Produces enough revenue, not only to do my equity fund for small businesses, but also to provide universal child care for every baby in this country, age zero to five. <laughs> universal pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old in this country. Raise the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher to the professional levels they deserve. Cover the cost so we can do tuition-free technical school, community college, and four-year college for everybody who wants to get an education. And cancel student loan debt for 95% of those who've got it. Two cents. Two cents on the dollar on the fortunes above $50 million is enough to produce the kind of investment in America that would help to close the black-white wealth gap. It would be enough. Oh, I left out a piece. $50 billion to the historically black colleges and universities are included in that plan. It's about building opportunity. It's about building leadership. It's about building an America where not just those born into wealth and privilege get chances in this life, but building an America where opportunity, true opportunity, is available to all of our kids. That's what this is about. Garza uh -huh. is a co-founder of Black Lives Matter and also a founder of the Black Future Lab. And she yes. had a question. Alicia, will you stand up? And we're going to bring the mic to you. Hello, Alicia. Hi, Senator Warren. Good to see you. My organization, the Black Futures Lab, surveyed 31,000 black people in America in the largest survey done in 154 years. The number one issue keeping 85% of our respondents up at night is wages that are too low to support a family. As you know, there are a lot of black communities who are wage earners and not owners. What will you do to ensure the structural reforms that are needed to make sure that black families who are wage earners can actually earn a wage that can support a family and let them get to sleep at night? Oh, so thank you for the question, Alicia. Can I just start this by saying how personally I feel this way? I, I grew up out in Oklahoma. My family didn't have much. All three of my brothers went off and joined the military. When it was down to just my mama and my daddy and me, my daddy had been selling paint and he had a massive heart attack and we thought he was gonna die. He made it, but he came home and he couldn't go to work. And I remember what it was like as a kid when this family station wagon was taken away. Uh, my mama would kiss me at night and put me to bed. And when she'd leave, I'd listen to him talk. And that's where I learned words like mortgage and foreclosure. I still remember the day walking into my folks' bedroom when my mother was crying. She was 50 years old. She'd never worked outside the home. She was terrified. But she finally looked at me, she wiped her face, she pulled on her best dress and her high heel shoes, and she walked to the Sears and she got a minimum wage job. And that minimum wage job saved our house. It also saved our family. But it was a different America. It was an America where a minimum wage job in America would support a family of three. It would pay a mortgage, it would cover the utilities, and it would put food on the table. If your job qualified as a minimum wage job, and they didn't make them all, we know the racial difference there, but if your job at least qualified as a minimum wage job, you had a chance, a toehold in America, a chance to build something in America's middle class. I watched today in Washington, and I understand that the story of my family was also a story of government. When I was a kid, the question asked in Washington on the minimum wage was, what will it take a family of three to survive? Today, the question asked in Washington is, 
Where should we set the minimum wage to maximize the profits of giant multinational corporations? Well, I'm in this fight because I don't want a government that works for giant multinational corporations. I want one that works for our families. So let's be really hard and practical about how you make that happen. And I want to start with a big one, and that is we make it easier to join a union and we give unions more power when they get out there and negotiate. Unions built America's middle class, and unions can rebuild America's middle class. We need more power in the hands of workers. Another part is that we need to rebuild our industrial base in America. I've got a plan to build 1.2 million new manufacturing jobs across this country. Those are the kind of jobs that families can actually build a real future from. And a third part to that is we got to ease up on the things it takes families to build a future. We make universal childcare available, high quality childcare, to every one of our babies you think how many mamas that frees up and how many daddies, how many can finish an education, can get a good job, right? And also all the way to the other end. You got a chance to go for free to technical school, to two-year college, to four-year college, to see your student loan debt erased, to know that your kids are gonna get that opportunity. That's how it is that we start to build a future. We got a problem in America, and the biggest part of that problem is we got a government that works. It works great. It works great for giant drug companies, yeah. right? Just not for people trying to fill a prescription. It works great for investors in private prisons, just not people whose lives have been destroyed by those prisons and whose communities are torn apart. It works great for giant oil companies that want to drill everywhere, just not for those of us who see climate change bearing down upon us. Our chance in 2020 is to change that, to make this a government, to make this an economy, to make this a country that doesn't just work for those born into privilege, but to make it a government and economy that works for everyone. That's our job. That's what we do. We are out of time. Oh. Senator Elizabeth Warren, thank oh, you so thank much. You We're so back much. right after this. Thank you. The BET Black Economic Alliance Presidential Forum will continue in a moment. Up next, Mayor Pete Boot Edge Edge. Joining us today, he graduated from Harvard, spent time overseas as a Naval Reserve officer in Afghanistan, and since 2011, he has served as the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Thank you. There's a lot of evidence um, that voters want to hear specifics. When polled uh, by the Black Economic Alliance, the survey found that 75% of black Americans said that they would be more likely to support a presidential candidate as long as that person had a clear plan on advancing economic opportunities for black communities. So walk me through your plan specifically for black Americans. Right, so I think that uh, in order to truly speak to black America, we need to be working across a number of different areas in which we see structural inequality that has persisted uh, in a way that, that won't just take care of itself. So the, so the philosophy of our plan is that you can't take uh, racist policies 
and replace them with neutral policies and expect things to get better. We need to be intentional. What racist policies are we talking about? Well, take uh, the criminal justice system, right? We know for a fact that uh, there is such disproportionality in sentencing and many other aspects of the way that policing and other encounters with the justice system work that we shouldn't be surprised that uh, the mass incarceration of Americans is something that happens disproportionately to black people. But we also can't reduce the experience of black America to encounters with the criminal justice system. So in addition to talking about those reforms, we want to be talking about black entrepreneurship in this country, black home ownership, the black experience with health and education. And we're putting forward a plan that we believe will be as ambitious as the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe after World War II. Call it the Douglas Plan, after Frederick Douglass, who insisted that America better live up to its promise, because right now, it's not. And we have to be intentional to do something about that. Give me some specifics of the Douglas Plan. It was written about in papers here locally. Tick through for me some of the specific details that the Douglas Plan would do to move the needle for black people. For example, when we think about entrepreneurship, we need to dramatically increase the rate at which the business of the federal government, which gives out hundreds of billions of dollars in contracts a year, goes to black and other minority-owned businesses. We think that increasing that to 25 percent uh, would increase dramatically the wealth that goes into communities of color across this country, and it would be the right thing to do. We also believe that uh, when it comes to the criminal justice system, we have to be dramatically more ambitious in setting concrete targets for what it's going to take to end mass incarceration. We, in order to just join the ranks of developed countries that don't incarcerate shocking proportions of their population, should be reducing by 50% the number of people incarcerated in this country. Very that, ambitious, but many are in state systems and not in federal systems, which right. as president, you would have less influence over. Obviously. That's right, although the federal government has a lot of influence on how state and local jurisdictions act. Uh, the problem is that influence right now is being used in the wrong direction. I'll give you an example. Uh, the only time I've heard from the Department of Justice of this administration on, on the subject of uh, interacting with our local government, local police department, was that when they sent me a letter threatening that we would lose the grant funding that we use to help keep our community safe, unless I promise to involve our local law enforcement in immigration. We told them what they could do with that letter. Did you lose but, the funding? What's that? Did you lose the funding? So the cities are suing and winning, and I believe we're going to get the funding without having to sign up for a promise that is immoral and uh, inconsistent with the way the federal government ought to interact with local government. So that's what you don't do. But what you can do is have a carrot and stick relationship between the federal government and the states that starts with just leading by example, because we do have a federal prison system. Uh, we do have federal sentencing, and that's where we can start uh, by ending uh, mandatory minimums, uh, incarceration as a solution for possession, lead by example and show states the way but also provide the kind of assistance that would help states do the right thing. For example, there are a lot of cases where we have alternatives to incarceration through things like diversion programs, drug courts. One of the main reasons that we're not seeing more people diverted isn't that uh, uh, no place wants to do it, it's that there is such a backlog of even being able to get access to that alternative. And so people instead wind up, uh, because there's simply a shortage of uh, the, the ability to have the, these uh, uh, diversion courts up and running, you see a shortage of people able to take advantage of that and more incarceration. The federal government has to be an ally to communities that want to do the right thing, as well as providing the oversight for communities that are failing to do the right thing, whether that is around policing, uh, incarceration, or any other issue in the criminal justice system. You talked about entrepreneurship, and we have a, a woman who's an entrepreneur in the audience, and I okay. was going to ask her if she would ask her question. Smorel, Smorel Nicole Brown owns us restaurants in town. Will you grab the mic and stand up for me and ask your question of Mayor Pete? So beginning our first location 10 years ago, my mother, with even a decent credit score, was turned down by several lenders. And I've learned through experience that entrepreneurship is a lifestyle and mindset. What proactive programs will you implement to assist black business owners in learning about protecting their credit scores, breaking the scarcity mindset, and wealth creation as well as legacy building? May I add on to that? Sure. If you're working in the black community, that's often considered for a bank a risky right. strategy, and so already you're going to have a problem getting a loan. 
That's right. And uh, uh, first of all, congratulations on uh, your success in, in building enterprise. But it is uh, not something that we're making very easy right now as a country. Uh, and it is hard enough, frankly, especially in, in your sector, in, uh, in hospitality, uh, to make it without the added barriers that so many entrepreneurs of color face. Uh, we know that there are a lot of issues with the way credit scoring and credit assessment is done right now that add to this kind of inequality. And I'm very worried living in an era when more and more of this is going to be done by algorithms and, and by big data, that we're going to automate inequality uh, by uh, failing to be intentional about how some of these algorithms pick up structures and systems and, and attitudes and assumptions that are already racist in nature. Uh, so we need to look wholesale at how things like access to credit and scoring of credit work uh, to break down racial bias in them. The good news is the same tools that can perpetuate bias can also help us uh, find it. They can help us analyze where these credit tools got it wrong mistakenly and unfairly classified a black entrepreneur or an entrepreneur with a black customer base as higher risk when that actually had no bearing on how successful their business was going to be. You've spoken very openly about your struggles at times to reach black voters. Why do you think that is and what are you going to do about it? Well, a lot of it is because I'm new on the scene and I'm not myself from a community of color. And black voters I talk to frankly feel burned and taken advantage of by politicians in both parties uh, who come along making lavish promises, taking a vote for granted, showing up just before the election. And so as far as what I'm doing about it, part of it is making sure opportunities like today uh, and others that we are uh, engaging with black activists, with black entrepreneurs, with black voters and black leaders uh, to talk about what an agenda for black America is really going to look like. Uh, you know, uh, some of the pastors I remember back home, we're about 25% African American in South Bend, uh, never could have become mayor and certainly never could have succeeded uh, without a strong relationship with our black community. And I remember a pastor saying to me uh, early on when I was getting started, you know, everybody knows how to come to church just before an election. I want to see what you do afterwards. Um, and I think there's that feeling more general. Um, so that's why we have to have uh, an authentic encounter with people everywhere we find them and, of course, present the, the substance of our agenda, the policies we're trying to get through, but also explain the values that those policies come from. Uh, too often, I'm afraid that the Democrats have this habit of talking in, in jargon, talking very technically about our policies in a way that, uh, I mean, there should be no confusion about what our policies are. But I think we don't talk enough about the values that make us Democrats, ideas like, like freedom that conservatives talk about all the time, as if, as if they own the market on freedom. But they only think about freedom as you know, cutting regulation, cutting government. I think uh, you're not free if you don't have access to health care. You know, freedom means economic freedom. Freedom, in my view, means women's reproductive freedom. And men need to be twice as vocal about it. You're not free if there's a veil of mistrust between you as a, as a resident of color and, and the officers who are sworn to keep you safe. That's freedom, too. It's not just something you can achieve by tearing down government. And so uh, talking in terms not just of policies but of values, freedom, security, democracy, faith, uh, you know, I think that we also need to establish that God does not belong to a political party. So... So I'm going to make sure that, that we do everything we can to reach everyone we can with that message and invite people to help shape this campaign as well, I hope, as to support it. One thing left off your list was uh, education, and I'd be curious. You've said you don't support free tuition. What is your strategy for dealing with debt that is crushing so many young and not even, not so, you know, not right. so young people who yeah. are trying to pay off their student loans. Yeah, we're right there. Chasten and I as a household have six-figure student debt, so this issue is personal for me. It would be interesting if you become president to also be writing checks to the government to pay oh, off yeah. your student loans. Yep, we'll be doing that. <laughs> and there are a number of steps we need to take. Some of them are on the back end for families like ours that, that are facing student debt. Uh, if you can refinance a home, you ought to be able to refinance your student loan. It's common sense. We also need to face the fact that there are a lot of for-profit colleges that have taken advantage of people. And when we talk about debt relief, we should start with the colleges that would have failed. Of course, they got, this administration got rid of it. But the Obama administration set a clear bar 
uh, for these for-profit colleges and the ones that were simply not delivering value. The colleges that failed that test, you should have your debt forgiven because uh, they have turned the Department of Education into a predatory lender, and we've got to put that right. Now, that's on the back end. On the front end, we've got to make it more affordable to go to college for the next generation, and that's why we need to double Pell Grants, and this time, let's actually tie it to inflation so we don't have to go back to Congress every time. Why don't so you support example. free tuition? I do support free tuition for low- and middle-income people, people who are first, uh, you know, often the, the first in their uh, family to be able to go. But I just don't believe that uh, all of us, especially low-income people, should be paying to cover the very last dollar even for the child of a billionaire going to a college. I think if you're a child of a billionaire, you, you can take care of yourself. Uh, and, and you ought to be able to pay some tuition. Uh, but for people who are low income, where it's a real barrier, then of course, I think we ought to be able to make it possible to leave college debt free. Now, there's one other thing I want to mention that I think is getting missed in this whole debate over college affordability, as important as it is. Um, it's definitely too expensive to go to college in this country. It's also way too expensive to not go to college in this country. Yeah. And we've got to pay attention to making it possible to live a decent lifestyle, whether you got a college degree or not. And that goes to everything from minimum wages to technical education. As mayor of a small town, is gentrification good or bad? Gentrification is not good. If, if, when, if by gentrification we mean that people are being driven out of their neighborhoods, when some there is people, economic some development. Some people take it to mean economic development that makes a community better. The rents are raised. If you own a home, you could sell it for more money. New restaurants come in. Uh, we love seeing economic growth, but it's got to be economic growth that doesn't leave behind the people who've been in these neighborhoods all along. Um, now, That's a very I, difficult balance. How do you do that? So I come from a relatively low-income community, uh, about $20,000 per capita income in our city. Uh, there are parts of the city where we're very concerned about gentrification, mostly the area right around the university. And there's a strong neighborhood partnership to make sure that the neighbors continue to have a voice and a role. Um, there are other areas where we've got serious problems related to housing, but uh, it's not the, the problems you read about in big cities related to gentrification. Often we'll have a, a place, in my city, you can get a pretty good house for thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And um, I know people in some of the bigger cities uh, find that surprising. You got to move to South Bend. I was going to say, I'm um, about to buy a house in South Bend. Well, we're also, back to this question about access to credit, we're hearing about a lot of families that find, strangely, that uh, the price of the house is actually too low for them to get credit uh, because a bank doesn't even consider it worth their while to write a, a loan on a house of that price. So my point is there are a lot of different dynamics going on in housing markets, even within one city, like my city, let alone across the country. And we need uh, a Department of Housing and Urban Development and, a, and a, 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 an overall housing strategy for a country that can tell the difference. But a big part of that is making sure that we empower residents to live in uh, integrated, economically and integrated, uh, uh, racially integrated neighborhoods when they want to, because we're all better off. And uh, let's face the fact that Segregation of our neighborhoods didn't just happen. Matter of fact, there are neighborhoods that were integrated 100 years ago that became segregated in the middle of the last century because of federal government policy. The United States segregated these neighborhoods, and the United States will have to work to put that right. And it's why I think we need, as part of the, what we're calling the Douglas Plan, uh, to have a 21st Century Homestead Act that supports people in being able to build wealth and equity while also building up neighborhoods in historically underserved areas and making sure we s target that support to those most, uh, most at risk of being driven out. Mayor Pete Buttigieg, nice to have you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. The BET Black Economic Alliance Presidential Forum will continue in a moment. Up next, Senator Cory Booker.
certainly not least, I'm joined by our final 2020 candidate today. He's a graduate of Stanford, Oxford, and Yale, and served as the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. He is currently a U.S. Senator from New Jersey. Please welcome Cory Booker. Nice to have you here. Yeah. I, I have to say, I have never got so many text messages telling me from fellow Deltas. Tell, tell, tell that Delta I said hello. <laughs> the so. Deltas always show up strong. For you, yes, yes. There are my sores. <laughs> yes. So um, let's talk about how you think about black wealth and black economic security. There are so many ways in which you could look at it, right? We could talk about debt, we could talk about savings, we could talk about college, we could talk about opportunity, we could talk about job training. Where do you focus how you think about opportunities? Give me number one and number two. Well, I, I just wanna orient uh, folks to my life experience. This has been my entire professional life, living and working in African-American communities. I'm the only person in the United States Senate that lives in a black and brown inner city uh, community below the poverty line. And so my whole professional life has been dealing with these issues and you can't separate them out. Uh, the fact that you have educational inequalities that are still savage in this country affects uh, economic empowerment. The fact that black access to capital is so dramatically different than the majority in this country is problematic. Uh, even something I found, which I think a lot of Democratic, African-American Democrats have a right to have a trust deficit with the Democratic Party, that even when I got to the United States Senate, I was stunned at how lack of diversity we had in the United States Senate for Democrats that were elected by African Americans. And so for me, this has been uh, about trying to change those realities, not by singling out issues, but really doing a full court press on everything from housing to education, to access to capital, to even in healthcare. And, and that is a very big issue that relates to economic empowerment. So is, your strategy as president would be a full court press on multiple things simultaneously? Well, well, it, it, look, as a guy who was a mayor, it, it, in order to help my community thrive, I had to make sure my communities were safe because black men are 6% of the nation's population, but we make up about 55% of the homicide victims. And that has an economic impact. When, when we had a shooting in front of the IHOP in my community, uh, th that IHOP which used to run 24 hours, had such a dip in business, they had to cut the final shift. The women that worked in that, in that IHOP suddenly lost opportunities to catch extra shifts that they needed. So this idea that you can focus on one issue, we, we, as long as we have in our country such savage different outcomes, let me give you an example. In Boston, for example, the wealth of the average white family is about $240,000. The wealth of the average black family is $8. Now, now, the power of that is that it's, first of all, seeped in the overtly bigoted policies of our past, overtly ones that went all the way up to the 1970s. It also goes into the policies of today. Mass incarceration, as, as Michelle Alexander says in her incredible book, is the new Jim Crow. And if you have a criminal conviction, and we have thousands and thousands of African Americans who have been convicted, felony convictions for doing things that two of the last three presidents admit to doing, that means they can't get jobs. That means they can't get loans from the bank. I was with Nipsey Hussle's group that are using some legislation that I wrote and, and got passed with Tim Scott for opportunity zones. His people, T.I. and some of the other great activists in South Central told me Nipsey couldn't get a loan from a bank because he had a pr previous criminal conviction. So the, the inequalities are so perverse. If you don't have a consciousness for those, uh, and, and all the ways that we have to approach this, you're not gonna deal with the savage wealth inequalities and opportunity inequalities that, go, that face African-American communities. And it's really important to say this, because this isn't just about African-American communities. You cannot have large sections of your population denied equal access to markets, equal access to education, equal access to healthcare, and don't think that that's not a cancer that affects the body as a whole. In order to have justice for all, we need to have justice for all. Let's talk a little bit about automation and the future of work, which, as you extrapolated out, looks problematic for African Americans, to say the least. Broderick Johnson served in the Obama administration. He's here today yes. as a partner in a law firm, and I'm going to hand him the mic and have him stand up and ask his question. Thank you very much, and uh, it's great to see you, Senator. It's great to see you, my friend. Uh, many things that we, uh, it's important that we not overlook when it comes to workforce development, and one is the future of work. Uh, and as you know, automation, innovation, technology are changing the nature of work across all sectors, including, for example, the retail sector. 
As president, what would you do to make sure that African Americans are not displaced by the future of work, but actually have the opportunity to take advantage of the skills and opportunities that are coming our way in the future? So let, let me pull out three things really quick. Um, and, and again, living in, in a black and brown community, I see so many of my uh, neighbors, people in my neighborhood who work full-time jobs, catch extra shifts, work longer hours than even my parents did, and still at my local bodega need to use food stamps. And so we need to have a, a rule right away that if you're working a full-time job in America, no matter what your job is, you make a living wage in America. And we'll do that by raising the minimum wage. The second thing I wanna, I wanna pull out of that is I am one of those people that thinks it's appalling, especially as we compete with other countries who've gotten rid of this barrier, that we are saddling so many of our students with unconscionable student debt. And for the 21st century jobs, we wanna make sure that as we compete against other countries where in Germany it's 4%, 0% to 4% of median income of a family that go to college, that we remove those barriers, and that's why I believe in debt-free college, and making sure that we, for those people that already have debt, that can't wait till I become president, when I get to be president, we're gonna have absolute debt forgiveness programs for people that go into public interest work. But this is the area where you're gonna find this interesting. When I got to Washington, Knowing what I knew as a guy who had to turn around an inner city economy like we did, um, I knew that, that when I actually pulled the manufacturers together in my city and asked them what their biggest pain point was, I thought it was going to be property taxes. Their biggest pain point was that we can't find machinists. And I remember asking them, what does an average machinist get paid in your, in your factory? When he told me the salary, I think maybe I'll leave being a mayor and take that job. <laughs> We are not preparing people for the jobs of the 21st century that do not necessitate the degrees I have in political science, sociology. My dad used to look at me every time I racked up another degree, and he goes, boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, but you ain't hot. <laughs> um, uh, my first bill as United States Senator was saying we need to compete with Switzerland, Germany, by having the best apprenticeship programs in, on the planet Earth to prepare people for a new economy. And I'm telling you right now, you don't need a four-year co college degree anymore to be successful. I, had, I was at what's called the Black Hack, a Black Hackathon, where I had a small business telling me, we just hired a, a, a programmer who had a ninth grade formal education, but they were really good, and we paid them a six-figure salary. I will be a president that says there's many pathways to success. We should stop this society from looking down on people who do not have a college degree. We're going to prepare everyone for college success, for career success. You've talked a lot about baby bonds. So yes. baby bonds, a thousand dollar bond goes to a child when they're born and it gets added to, especially for people who are low income. And then at age 18, you can cash out yes. your bond. Critics have said, great, but you have to wait till that child is 18 and it really doesn't tackle child poverty. Right. So a couple of things. We need to plant lots of seeds in the garden of our democracy to, to create the kind of harvest we need. So that's why I have things like massive expansions of the earned income tax credit and changing the very definition of work. Because if you're at home and you're taking care of a, a spouse with Alzheimer's or a kid with special needs, that too is work and you're gonna qualify for my credit as well. But, but enough of already. I, I'm a data guy. When I was mayor of the city of Newark, I used to say, in God we trust, but everybody else bring me some data. Let me show the numbers of what works. And if we're trying to solve problems like my baby bonds do, which is massively increasing childhood success, closing the racial wealth gap, this is actually a piece of policy that we know changes those outcomes. Data shows that a child just knowing they have an interest-bearing account there for them increases college attendance rates threefold. And so the baby bonds legislation that I have, it puts $1,000 into a savings account for every child born in America. Remember, our tax code moves so much money towards people with wealth to create more wealth. Let's make sure as a birthright in America, every child has a chance at creating wealth because paychecks help us get ahead, but uh, it helps us get by, but wealth helps us get ahead. And so the baby bonds, what it does is every single year, so on your parents' income, you get up to $2,000 placed in that account. By the time that you are 18, if you were the lowest income Americans, you actually would have up to $50,000 to put towards training, to put towards college or buying a home. The things we know, the data shows, creates generational wealth. But that's not all. Because poverty is disproportionately impacting communities of color, 
We have, we have, we have white poor, black poor, Latino poor, Asian, we have poor folks in this country, but disproportionately it is low income people. The average black family, black child, under this program would get close to $30,000. The average white child, about $15,000. What Columbia University has said about my plan, and I have not seen one yet, and any other presidential candidate, this baby bonds program, Columbia University says, is a policy that for those kids now, it would virtually eliminate the racial wealth gap, giving everybody a fair start in creating wealth in this economy. And that's why I stand by the plan. Can you improve a community without gentrifying the very people who started it and supported it out of the community? So this, is, this was the great thing about uh, actually having a record as a chief executive of a state's largest city that is majority black. It's because we had these explicit conversations 15, 20 years ago in our city because we believed in Newark. Other folks might have looked down on us, overlooked us, cast us aside, but we knew we were charging back. By the time I was leaving to become a United States Senator, we went from a city with 60 years of decay and decline to now making us not only the first time in six years growing, but the biggest economic development boom our city's had in generations because we focused on shared growth. Part of that boom, Market Street, is now a lovely street to live on. Two bedroom apartment Market Street can cost you $2,900. And that's why for is every- Is that good or bad? Well, no, that's why for every housing project that we built in the city of Newark, we told those developers that you were gonna develop on our terms, not yours. And this meant understanding the multiplier effect. I had to have conversations with the building trades and say, look, your unions are great, I believe in union jobs, but if I'm gonna do this as union labor, I need to make sure that you have apprenticeship programs for minority kids in my community. I wanna make sure that you have people from my community working. We also said that if you're gonna build housing and use our uh, city resources, that you're gonna make sure that 30% of this project, 40, we have projects over 50% for affordable housing as well. And so I, I, we just literally had a, the National Conference on Gentrification where in Newark, New Jersey, showing the models we've used for shared development. It is not a fait accompli that we are gonna have a country that when cities come back, you'll see this in many cities where they push low-income people out. That doesn't, these are conscious policy decisions. We've made them in the past racially conscious decisions to gentrify, to redline our communities, and now we need to change that. And that's one of the reasons why I've put forward, this is a really wonderful experience for me because when I used to be in Newark watching presidential campaigns, I was always saying, we're not our issues gonna get talked about. Well, now I'm a presidential candidate and I'm rolling out policy that affects my community. For example, we just rolled out the most ambitious housing agenda to make sure gentrification doesn't happen by saying, if you are in a city where you're uh, where, the, where your rent, you're paying more than 30,000, 30% 30 of your rent, of your income on rent, that is the definition of housing insecurity. It's why people are moving out of cities. And so we have a renter's credit that is actually gonna make up the difference that you can get back on your taxes between that 30% and the area of fair market rent. Now these are things that are gonna help with demand and supply, but more than that, because I live in a low income community, evictions, to me are one of the most outrageous things that is this sense in America where we often are willing to pay more on the back end of a problem than making small investments. The cost of an eviction to American taxpayers when a family with children are kicked out of their home often over $500 in arrear or $700 in arrear, that costs multiples more to society in, the, in, in what we have to often make up in social services or in lost potential of that child. So I have anti-eviction measures in my housing, which is one very common sense thing, is 90% of, of, of landlords, when they go to rental court, they have lawyers. Low-income families don't have that, only about 10% do. When you make lawyers available and suddenly give people a fair fight, they stay in their homes, and it pays for itself in multiples. We need to start giving a, an understanding that if you are going to literally sing the song in America, that we are the home of the brave. It's about time we have policy that makes sure that working Americans can have a home and a roof over their head for their children. Senator Cory Booker. Thank you, Senator Booker. Thank you nice to much. have you. Thank you for joining us today. We're gonna take one final break, and then I'll be back with some closing thoughts in just a moment. Stay with us.
We want to close today with a few final notes. First, we want to thank and acknowledge all the presidential candidates who joined us today, Cory Booker, Pete Buttigieg, Elizabeth Warren, and Beto O'Rourke. We know the racial wealth gap in this country is growing, and we know that our government's policies helped create these disparities, and it will take specific policy changes to address them. We heard a lot of ideas and proposals offered today by these candidates, but it's up to you to stay engaged in the political process. Find out where the candidates stand on all of the issues. And of course, if you're not registered yet, register to vote. The black vote will be critical in determining the next Democratic presidential nominee and the next president. Don't let any candidate take your vote for granted. We want to thank the Black Economic Alliance again for organizing this event at the Charleston Music Hall for hosting us. And for all of us at BET News, thank you for watching.